Part three, chapter one, the fete, first part, section four. I ran out to him behind the scenes once more, and had time to warn him excitedly that in my opinion the game was up, that he had better not appear at all, but had better go home at once, on the excuse of his usual ailment, for instance, and I would take off my badge and come with him. At that instant he was on his way to the platform. He stopped suddenly, and haughtily looking me up and down, he pronounced solemnly, What grounds have you, sir, for thinking me capable of such baseness? I drew back. I was as sure as twice two make four that he would not get off without a catastrophe. Meanwhile, as I stood utterly dejected, I saw moving before me again the figure of the professor, whose turn it was to appear after Stepan Trofimovitch, and who kept lifting up his fist and bringing it down again with a swing. He kept walking up and down, absorbed in himself, and muttering something to himself with a diabolical but triumphant smile. I somehow almost unintentionally went up to him. I don't know what induced me to meddle again. Do you know, I said, judging from many examples, if a lecturer keeps an audience for more than twenty minutes, it won't go on listening. No celebrity is able to hold his own for half an hour. He stopped short and seemed almost quivering with resentment. Infinite disdain was expressed in his countenance. Don't trouble yourself, he muttered contemptuously, and walked on. At that moment Stepan Trofimovitch's voice rang out in the hall. Oh, hang you all, I thought, and ran to the hall. Stepan Trofimovitch took his seat in the lecturer's chair in the midst of the still persisting disorder. He was greeted by the first rows with looks which were evidently not over-friendly. Of late, at the club, people almost seemed not to like him and treated him with much less respect than formerly. But it was something to the good that he was not hissed. I had had a strange idea in my head ever since the previous day. I kept fancying that he would be received with hisses as soon as he appeared. They scarcely noticed him, however, in the disorder. What could that man hope for if Karmazinov was treated like this? He was pale. It was ten years since he had appeared before an audience. From his excitement and from all that I knew so well in him, it was clear to me that he, too, regarded his present appearance on the platform as a turning point of his fate, or something of the kind. That was just what I was afraid of. The man was dear to me. And what were my feelings when he opened his lips and I heard his first phrase? Ladies and gentlemen, he pronounced suddenly, as though resolved to venture everything, though in an almost breaking voice. Ladies and gentlemen, only this morning there lay before me one of the illegal leaflets that have been distributed here lately, and I asked myself for the hundredth time, wherein lies its secret? The whole hall became instantly still. All looks were turned to him, some with positive alarm. There was no denying. He knew how to secure their interest from the first word. Heads were thrust out from behind the scenes. Liputin and Lyamshin listened greedily. Yulia Mikhailovna waved to me again. Stop him! Whatever happens, stop him! she whispered in agitation. I could only shrug my shoulders. How could one stop a man resolved to venture everything? Alas, I understood what was in Stepan Trofimovitch's mind. Aha! The manifestos was whispered in the audience. The whole hall was stirred. Ladies and gentlemen, I've solved the whole mystery. The whole secret of their effect lies in their stupidity. His eyes flashed. Yes, gentlemen, if this stupidity were intentional, pretended and calculated, oh, that would be a stroke of genius. But we must do them justice. They don't pretend anything. It's the barest, most simple-hearted, most shallow stupidity. C'est la bêtise dans son essence la plus pure. Quelque chose comme une simple chimique. If it were expressed ever so little more cleverly, everyone would see at once the poverty of this shallow stupidity. But as it is, everyone is left wondering. No one can believe that it is such elementary stupidity. It's impossible that there's nothing more in it, everyone says to himself, and tries to find the secret of it, sees a mystery in it, tries to read between the lines. The effect is attained. Oh, never has stupidity been so solemnly rewarded, though it has so often deserved it. 
for in parenthesis stupidity is of as much service to humanity as the loftiest genius epigram of eighteen forty was commented in a very modest voice however but it was followed by a general outbreak of noise and uproar ladies and gentlemen hurrah i propose a toast to stupidity cried stepan trofimovitch defying the audience in a perfect frenzy i ran up on the pretext of pouring out some water for him stepan trofimovitch leave off yulia mikhailovna entreats you to no you leave me alone idle young man he cried out at me at the top of his voice i ran away messieurs he went on why this excitement why the outcries of indignation i hear i have come forward with an olive branch i bring you the last word for in this business i have the last word and we shall be reconciled down with him shouted some hush let him speak let him have his say yelled another section the young teacher was particularly excited having once brought himself to speak he seemed now unable to be silent messieurs the last word in this business is forgiveness i an old man at the end of my life i solemnly declare that the spirit of life breathes in us still and there is still a living strength in the young generation the enthusiasm of the youth of today is as pure and bright as in our age all that has happened is a change of aim the replacing of one beauty by another the whole difficulty lies in the question which is more beautiful shakespeare or boots raphael or petroleum it's treachery growled some compromising questions agent provocateur but i maintain stepan trofimovitch shrilled at the utmost pitch of excitement i maintain that shakespeare and raphael are more precious than the emancipation of the serfs more precious than nationalism more precious than socialism more precious than the young generation more precious than chemistry more precious than almost all humanity because they are the fruit the real fruit of all humanity and perhaps the highest fruit that can be a form of beauty already attained but for the attaining of which i would not perhaps consent to live oh heavens he cried clasping his hands ten years ago i said the same thing from the platform in petersburg exactly the same thing in the same words and in just the same way they did not understand it they laughed and hissed as now shallow people what is lacking in you that you cannot understand but let me tell you let me tell you without the english life is still possible for humanity without germany life is possible without the russians it is only too possible without science without bread life is possible only without beauty it is impossible for there will be nothing left in the world that's the secret at the bottom of everything that's what history teaches even science would not exist a moment without beauty do you know that you who laugh it will sink into bondage you won't invent a nail even i won't yield an inch he shouted absurdly in confusion and with all his might banged his fist on the table but all the while that he was shrieking senselessly and incoherently the disorder in the hall increased many people jumped up from their seats some dashed forward nearer to the platform it all happened much more quickly than i describe it and there was no time to take steps perhaps no wish to either it's all right for you with everything found for you you pampered creatures the same divinity student bellowed at the foot of the platform grinning with relish at stepan trofimovitch who noticed it and darted to the very edge of the platform haven't i haven't i just declared that the enthusiasm of the young generation is as pure and bright as it was and that it is coming to grief through being deceived only in the forms of beauty isn't that enough for you and if you consider that he who proclaims this is a father crushed and insulted can one o oh shallow hearts can one rise to greater heights of impartiality and fairness ungrateful unjust why why can't you be reconciled and he burst into hysterical sobs he wiped away his dropping tears with his fingers his shoulders and breast were heaving with sobs he was lost to everything in the world a perfect panic came over the audience almost all got up from their seats yulia mikhailovna too jumped up quickly seizing her husband by the arm and pulling him up too the scene was beyond all belief 
stepan trofimovitch the divinity student roared gleefully there's fedka the convict wandering about the town in the neighbourhood escaped from prison he is a robber and has recently committed another murder allow me to ask you if you had not sold him as a recruit fifteen years ago to pay a gambling debt that is more simply lost him at cards tell me would he have got into prison would he have cut men's throats now in his struggle for existence what do you say mr esthete i decline to describe the scene that followed to begin with there was a furious volley of applause the applause did not come from all probably from some fifth part of the audience but they applauded furiously the rest of the public made for the exit but as the applauding part of the audience kept pressing forward towards the platform there was a regular block the ladies screamed some of the girls began to cry and asked to go home lemke standing up by his chair kept gazing wildly about him yulia mihailovna completely lost her head for the first time during her career amongst us as for stepan trofimovitch for the first moment he seemed literally crushed by the divinity student's words but he suddenly raised his arms as though holding them out above the public and yelled i shake the dust from off my feet and i curse you it's the end the end and turning he ran behind the scenes waving his hands menacingly he has insulted the audience verkovensky the angry section roared they even wanted to rush in pursuit of him it was impossible to appease them at the moment any way and a final catastrophe broke like a bomb on the assembly and exploded in its midst the third reader the maniac who kept waving his fist behind the scenes suddenly ran on to the platform he looked like a perfect madman with a broad triumphant smile full of boundless self-confidence he looked round at the agitated hall and he seemed to be delighted at the disorder he was not in the least disconcerted at having to speak in such an uproar on the contrary he was obviously delighted this was so obvious that it attracted attention at once what's this now people were heard asking who is this Shh! what does he want to say ladies and gentlemen the maniac shouted with all his might standing at the very edge of the platform and speaking with almost as shrill feminine a voice as karmazinov's but without the aristocratic lisp ladies and gentlemen twenty years ago on the eve of war with half europe russia was regarded as an ideal country by officials of all ranks literature was in the service of the censorship military drill was all that was taught at the universities the troops were trained like a ballet and the peasants paid the taxes and were mute under the lash of serfdom patriotism meant the ringing of bribes from the quick and the dead those who did not take bribes were looked upon as rebels because they disturbed the general harmony the birch copses were extirpated in support of discipline europe trembled but never in the thousand years of its senseless existence had russia sunk to such ignominy he raised his fist waved it ecstatically and menacingly over his head and suddenly brought it down furiously as though pounding an adversary to powder a frantic yell rose from the whole hall there was a deafening roar of applause almost half the audience was applauding their enthusiasm was excusable russia was being put to shame publicly before everyone who could fail to roar with delight this is the real thing come this is something like hurrah yes this is none of your aesthetics the maniac went on ecstatically twenty years have passed since then universities have been opened and multiplied military drill has passed into a legend officers are too few by thousands the railways have eaten up all the capital and have covered russia as with a spider's web so that in another fifteen years one will perhaps get somewhere bridges are rarely on fire and fires in towns occur only at regular intervals in turn at the proper season in the law courts judgments are as wise as solomon's and the jury only take bribes through the struggle for existence to escape starvation the serfs are free and flog one another instead of being flogged by the landowners seas and oceans of vodka are consumed to support the budget and in novgorod opposite the ancient and useless saint sophia there has been solemnly put up a colossal bronze globe to celebrate a thousand years of disorder and confusion europe scowls and begins to be uneasy again 
fifteen years of reforms and yet never even in the most grotesque periods of its madness has russia sunk the last words could not be heard in the roar of the crowd one could see him again raise his arm and bring it down triumphantly again enthusiasm was beyond all bounds people yelled clapped their hands even some of the ladies shouted enough you can't beat that some might have been drunk the orator scanned them all and seemed revelling in his own triumph i caught a glimpse of lemke in indescribable excitement pointing something out to somebody yulia mihailovna with a pale face said something in haste to the prince who had run up to her but at that moment a group of six men officials more or less burst onto the platform seized the orator and dragged him behind the scenes i can't understand how he managed to tear himself away from them but he did escape darted up to the edge of the platform again and succeeded in shouting again at the top of his voice waving his fist but never has russia sunk but he was dragged away again i saw some fifteen men dash behind the scenes to rescue him not crossing the platform but breaking down the light screen at the side of it i saw afterwards though i could hardly believe my eyes the girl student Virginsky's sister leap onto the platform with the same roll under her arm dressed as before as plump and rosy as ever surrounded by two or three women and two or three men and accompanied by her mortal enemy the schoolboy i even caught the phrase ladies and gentlemen i've come to call attention to the sufferings of poor students and to rouse them to a general protest but i ran away hiding my badge in my pocket i made my way from the house into the street by back passages which i knew of first of all of course i went to stepan trofimovitch's end of part three chapter one